All right, thanks a lot. I'm getting over a three week cold right now and this is my first time out of the house. So I'm contagious and I probably sound like crap. So, uh, and I'm gonna cough a bit. <clears throat> so my apologies. A bit about me, um, my name is Brian Weisberg. I started my career off as a professional nerd at IBM. Um, I spent some time at McKinsey and Company as a management consultant. Uh, after a couple of years, I, I went back to get my MBA, which is really a two-year vacation. I recommend it to anybody. <laughs> and I've lived in Norway since 2007, 2008 time period. And uh, over the last few years, I've been running Beta Factory, which is a startup accelerator. And I'll go into a little bit more detail as to what startup accelerators are. So uh, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to get right into it, the, uh, talking about the business of, of startup investing. So. If you're raising money for your business, the first thing that you can do is bootstrap, which essentially means you go out, you find ways of making money um, in order to finance your business. Usually this is consulting. Uh, a lot of very successful businesses have been started where one or two people will go out and consult, and the money that they bring back pays the salaries of everybody else as they make money. Uh, a second way is you can bring on an angel investor, and an angel investor is somebody who invests their own money um, you can go out and you can re, uh, raise seed capital. Seed capital is very distinct in that it's usually the earliest stage of, of money that comes in from a professional investor, and it's specifically designed to help you to get your product to a stage where it's viable in the marketplace, where you can start selling it to, to uh, customers. Local capital is, like they say, it's, it's investment capital to help you grow locally. Uh, most of the businesses that I invest in have global ambitions, but I'm not going to give them enough money in order to grow globally if they haven't tried it in Norway or in the Nordics first. Then you have expansion capital, which is exactly what it sounds like. Mezzanine capital. You see, typically as you're growing, you have a very specific event. Maybe it's an IPO, maybe it's um, an acquisition, but you need just a little bit of capital to hold you over, and that's what mezzanine capital is. Strategic capital, that would be an investment from, say, Telenor, if you were making a mobile application. And then you could go public. You can have your IPO, and you can uh, get your shares traded on the stock exchange. Now, everything within here, from seed up to, up to strategic, that, that's what we would call venture capital. Everything before, everything after is um, non-professional investors, generally. So an angel is someone who invests their own money. The best person that you want is someone who's a wealthy expert in the industry. And hopefully they became wealthy because of their expertise in the industry. Um, the next best person that you would want is someone who's a helpful professional, someone who knows how to run a business, someone who knows the challenges and can actually be helpful for you. Um, the, the next stage, you know, a little less helpful, would just be a wealthy entrepreneur, someone who has built a business before but might not know your industry particularly well. Next, they have what they call doctors, dentists, and lawyers. Now, some of these helpful professionals might be lawyers, um, but doctors, dent doctors, dentists, and lawyers are kind of industry term for somebody who has a lot of money but doesn't really provide any value to you as a entrepreneur. And then the last level, the lowest level, is the friends, families, and fools. People that will give you money based upon who you are, based upon your relationship. This is probably the last place where you want to look for money because it makes Christmas very, very difficult um, because it's most likely that you will lose their money. So I'm going to talk a little bit about venture capital investors, the professional investors, the ones that invest other people's money. Um, and within the industry, they actually have, have an expression for that. They just call it OPM, other people's money. Um, and, and so you'll have a fund manager. And this would be someone like uh, Alliance Venture. This would be someone like North Zone, Crandom, Kleiner Perkins. These are fund managers. Now, they create an investment fund. It's a completely separate company. And they go out and they find investors to put money into this fund. These investors might be the state, might be insurance companies. Uh, in the United States, there's a lot of insurance companies or, or large colleges or, or foundations that put money into, into venture capital. And then this investment fund will then make investments into startups. So in the terminology of uh, venture capital, these are what we call limited partners, which means their exposure and their involvement in the whole process is very, very limited. 
So it's a very uh, uh, specific definition that makes the fund manager the general partner. Now, there, there's a couple different relationships here, and, and it's very important. So for example, the investors have a relationship with the investment fund. They commit capital. They lock up their capital typically for up to 10 years, sometimes even longer. Um, and their, their commitment is essentially no more than just writing a check when, when the money is necessary. Now, from the investors to the startups, um, the investors will sometimes know what startups they invest in uh, through the investment fund, but there's no real relationship here. The startups usually don't care who the investors are within the startup fund, so there's not much of a rela relationship. The fund manager is really the, the, the connection between the startup and the, the investment fund. So even though the fund manager doesn't technically uh, own shares, the fund manager is the one that's responsible prov for providing advice and providing resources, because they get paid very healthily if this investment fund does well. Uh, typically, they will make 2% of all the cash annually, and then they'll make about 20% of the profits. So let's put some actual numbers behind that. The, uh, most recent uh, seed fund that was uh, started up earlier this year was 510 million NOC. That means that if they're getting paid, I don't have any insider information there, but if they're getting paid kind of a standard rate, that's 2% on 500 million, so that's 10 million NOC per year guaranteed for 10 years. It's not bad. Um, and when you, when you add that up, that's 2% for 10 years. That's 20% of all the capital just goes towards the manager. And then if they happen to be successful and find the next Facebook, they could share quite a bit of, of the, the profit there. So it's a profitable business for the fund manager, but it's a very long-term game. And so as you go out and you talk to the VCs, there is this asymmetry. You have to understand the, the role of the fund manager and what it is that they provide uh, if you're, if you're going to raise money from them. So there's, there's another round, which is corporate venture capital, which is a, a very big deal these days. So there are large corporations that are making pretty substantial investments in startups. And they do that for a couple reasons. They want to make some money. They want to build their brand. They want to get out there and, and, and show that they are an innovative company. For example, Disney just had a, uh, a, a round of startups that they invested in. They might want to create partnerships. This is a big deal on the West Coast, as companies like Statoil will make investments in, in, in companies. Uh, they might give you money in order to become a customer. Uh, so for example, Microsoft is very, very friendly to startups. And they give you free software, and they might even give you some money. But of course, that's if you build your technology on top of Microsoft um, technology. Or vendor creation. This is a very good example. Um, Statoil, if you're making a really interesting widget for uh, an oil rig, they might give you money so that you can complete the engineering process so that they can then become a customer of yours. There might be competitive intelligence. They want to know what's going on out there in the market. Or they want to leverage underutilized assets, because they might have something that they don't really know what to do with. So why not use that? Why not attach some startups? A really good example there is Telenor owns the site Abyssa Startseeden. Has anyone been to startseeden.no in the last year? No. OK, in the last year. <laughs> OK, so no, no, no. Um, they make a, an obscene amount of money, and they're now out there making investments uh, through the Abyssa Startseeden uh, subsidiary because it's a really underused asset. And so they can put some of that cash flow back into startups. And so when you think about corporate venture capital, the objective is either strategic or it's financial. And then you're going to be linked to the operation either you know, very tightly or very loosely. So a passive investment is going to be something that's purely financial and you're not really linked to the, to the operations of the investor. And enabling technology is something that it, it's strategic maybe in the long run, but they're making this investment just in case you turn out to be really right. Um, and emergent technology is something that, that is very core to their business. Um, but um, you know, I think YouTube and Google, you know, this will end up becoming a, a very uh, big business. YouTube's probably worth $50 billion right now. So that was a very emergent investment because it, it, it was tight, but it's not really connected. It's not uh, 
uh, strategic drive. And then there's driving investments. If you have a technology, if you have a startup that is core to the strategic and financial future of a company, odds are that they will give you a little bit of money. What to them is a little bit of money, what to you might be more money than you've ever dreamed of, um, in order to, uh, to really uh, drive your company forward. So an example of that is Shipstead Vexed. Shipstead is massive. Um, you know, they have Vega, they have uh, Often Post, and they have Finn here. But what you don't realize is Shipstead is massive. Behind eBay, they're the number two provider of online classifieds in the world. And they are very, very good. So what they will do is they will come out and they will make a 20% investment in your company. Uh, it's a very strict process, but they will make an investment. And then they will give you lots and lots of free advertising. And then if the advertising works, after about 12 to 18 months, then they will give you more money and they will buy 51% of your company, essentially taking over. But then they still give you that 49% in order to see how well you do over the next few years. And if you do an extremely good job, they will buy 100% of your company based upon a multiple of what your earnings are. So if you make a very profitable business, they might give you eight times the, the the, the amount of profit that you make in a year. And so there are people that will exit from Shipstead Vexed Investments for hundreds of millions of kroner. And this is very important because um, <clears throat> I guess it was about two years ago I was talking to the head of Shipstead Vexed and that was at the point that Groupon was still advertising quite a bit and they had their let's deal and in front of the, the, the entrepreneurs that he was talking he said, you know what, we give five million kroner of free advertising a week to let's deal. We can give five million kroner free longer than Groupon can afford to pay for, uh, pay cash for their investments or for their advertisements. So they are very aggressive. And if you're in the media space and you don't consider talking to them, you might find yourself on the uh, opposite end of that, um, that juggernaut. Then there's startup accelerators. This is what Beta Factory is. Um, so first of all, we have a highly competitive selection process. Um, we definitely turn down, you know, nine out of ten of the companies that we talk with, um, of the ones that submit applications or, 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 uh, or that uh, we will interview. We provide initial capital, so something about maybe 100,000 kroner, give or take 20, based upon how big the team is. We make simultaneous investments in cohorts. And this is where it starts to be different than typical venture capital. A typical seed investor or a venture capital investor might make one investment now, and then three months later, they'll make another one. We like to make all of our investments at the same time, which provides a sense of community uh, within, the, within the, uh, the entrepreneurs. And everybody starts and ends the, the Beta Factory program at the same time. Uh, because we found that, yes, it's great to have mentoring, but it's also more important to have peers that are at the same stage. We provide active mentoring uh, as opposed to passive mentoring, I guess. Uh, but we have people who have given us money, who have given their time, um, who will come in and become very active within the process. And, and sometimes they'll become board members or investors in the companies later on. When necessary, we give education and entrepreneurship. We have a whole curriculum that we make sure people go through. We provide connections to the business community. You know, really good examples. We had a uh, company that was really on fire last year, and they were looking to go to London. And through our mentor network, we were able to fill their entire calendar uh, in London with great people to talk to. Uh, we provide necessary infrastructure. Really, what that means is office space, and we, um, you know, provide other, you know, resources. Uh, if you need access to certain technology from a company, odds are we know somebody who uh, who can help get access to that. Then lastly, visibility in the media and to investors. The last day of Beta Factory, the last day of most startup accelerators, is a demo day. And at that demo day, you stand up in a room filled with investors. Uh, we had about 150 people, uh, billions of kroner of invested, investable capital at our demo day last time. And um, you have a, a captive audience for 10 minutes. And so how are you going to make use of that? So those are the different types of investors that you'll find out on your journey trying to raise money. And this is the mechanics of how new investments are made. 
And granted, with the MBA in finance, I sometimes take for granted the fact that most people don't understand the, uh, how company shares are divided up. So my apologies if this is a little basic for some of you, but um, <clears throat> it, it, uh, it's not rocket science, so I should be able to explain it. So if you have a company and you have one share in the company, you own 100%. As I said, it's pretty basic. If you have two shares, two shares, 100%. And all you have to do to go from one share to two shares is just split the shares. You can issue new shares. Uh, so you can go from two to 50 shares. All you have to do is call up the government, sign a couple pieces of paper, and say, our company is now divided 50 ways. Most companies are started with um, about 100 shares or 1,000 shares, some nice round number. And then if you're starting the business with somebody else, let's say you, yep, OK. So you split it. Sorry, transitions here. They take for a while. OK. OK, yeah. So uh, split it 50-50, 50 shares for Alice, 50 shares for Bob. Those are our two, uh, uh, two people in our story here. OK, so Alice and Bob split the company, 100 shares, 50 shares each. This right here is called a capitalization table, or cap table for short. So here we have the shareholder is Alice or Bob. Number of shares is 50 and 50. They own 50% ownership here. The original cost, let's say each of them put in 50,000 kroner to start a company. You can't just create a company or an auction sales cup. You need to put money into an account. It's now 30,000 kroner. It used to be 100,000 kroner. Um, but because there's only 50,000 kroner uh, each, 100,000 kroner total sitting in here, the value of the company is just the cash that they put in. Now, the whole point of them starting the company is to increase the current value of the company. And how do you create value? There's lots of different ways that value can be created within a company. So you can have a product. That's very basic. So you create a product, people buy it, people want it, you make money from it. You can have a patent. In a lot of areas, it's not really uh, a good idea for you to make the, the, the product, say biotech, but the patent itself might be worth billions. You can have a brand. Um, I could put pretty much whatever I want into this bottle and then put a Pepsi logo on it and people will buy it. Brands have value, and if you have a very strong brand, that is value creation. And then the most successful one is customers. If you have customers and you have uh, customer relationships that are sustainable, then your company has value. So let's assume that Alice and Bob go out there, they build a product, maybe file a patent, they have a nice brand, and they have some customers. So the value of their, their company is now 1 million kroner. It used to be just the value of the cash, but now they've created value. And so in the terminology of an investor, we'd say that their valuation is 1 million nok. Now, an investor comes in and offers 500,000 kroner for a third of the company. Now, we go back to what the, the structure looks like. <coughs> Apologies. If someone buys a third of the company, um, a lot of people think you just take a third, sell it off to the investor. There's one main problem here. First of all, you can't split shares into a third. And a secondary problem is the investor would have to pay Alice and Bob for these shares. That's not always a big deal. But in the case of most investors, they want the money to go into the company. They don't want to buy the shares from the other investors or the other, the other founders. So what happens is you literally just create 50 new shares. So now 150 shares equals 100% of the company. So Alice and Bob have a business. It's worth a million nok. So we say that their pre-money valuation is one million nok. They bring in a seed investor who gives 500,000 nok. And now the company is worth 1.5 million. So we say that their post-money valuation is 1.5. Now you can see on this cap table, there are a couple things that are interesting. So first of all, we have the seed investor. The seed investor owns the same number of shares as Alice and Bob each do. So the seed investor owns a third of the business. But the seed investor paid 500,000 kroner for their shares, whereas Alice and Bob only paid 50. That's because of the value creation. But because they all own the same amount, each one owns 500,000 uh, in value. OK, 
So let's go through a little bit of uh, investor math. And it's, it's, it's important to, to, to talk through some of this. So you have the pre-money valuation plus the money equals the post-money. It's very basic. but So the pre-money here is 1 million NOC. The money is 500,000. Post-money is 1.5. Now, when you start to talk about ownership, the ownership is the amount of money divided by the post-money valuation. So in this situation, 500,000 kroner divided by 1.5 million equals a third. So if someone says that I want to buy 20% of your company for 2 million NOC, that means that they're valuing your company today at 8, at eight million NOC. And then afterwards, the post-money valuation would be 10. So 2 over 10 would equal 20%. So that's, it's really, really basic math, but people tend to screw this up quite a bit. So. Um, I just wanted to go through this. OK, so after the investment, Alice and Bob uh, take the 500000 which goes into the company, and they create more value. Now their pre-money valuation is $6 million. So they went from 1.5 to 6. They've created quite a bit of value. They go out, and they raise what they call a Series A investment. The seed investor, and this gets into a little bit of the structure of the investment, et cetera. I'm not going to go into details there. But the Series A is typically the first professional venture capital investor. Uh, VCs don't typically want to go in as, as a seed investor. I know it's fashionable these days, but most want to go in as the Series A, saying, I'm the first professional guy on your cap table. Now, in this situation, we had a pre-money of 6, and we have a post-money of 10, 6 plus 4. So in the Series A, they raise 4 million NOC of additional money. Now, they have to sell 40% of the company in order to get that, that 4 million NOC, which that's kind of on the high end. Typically, an investment will go anywhere between 20 to 40%, 25 to 40% uh, in certain markets. So 40%, that's, that's pretty much the high end. And so we'll go through. So now the company is valued at, at 10. They create more value from that 4 million NOC that was invested. Now it's worth 25. They raise 15. So they went from 25 plus 15 equals 40. So they bring in a Series B investor who puts in 15 million NOC um, and buys 37.5% of the company. And you can see there's Series C, D, E, F, et cetera. Now, they create a pretty, pretty valuable um, company here. But at this point, there have been only private investors. And what a private investor means is one one person who uh, cannot typically go out and sell these on the stock exchange. There's, there's not really a market for private shares. Um, so in order to make it so that you can buy and sell the, the shares, you have to go onto the stock exchange. And that's what we call public investors. And that is a whole series of lectures. But um, you can ask questions if you need to. So when you have your IPO, initial public offering, the initial public offering of the shares. Uh, in this case, Alice and Bob have done a really great job. And the company what, that used to be worth 100 million NOC here is now worth 200 million because they went out and they sold a whole bunch of shares for, um, for 100 million NOC. Now, this is great. But um, you know, in this situation, any investor can go call up a broker and buy shares. But the problem is the value of one share is 250,000 NOC. So that gets to be a little difficult. So what they can do is they can do what they call splitting the shares. So you say, now every share that we have is now 1,000 shares. So instead of having 800 shares, we're going to have 800,000 shares in the company. You just split them. You, know, you trade in your one share. We'll give you 1,000 shares back. Uh, literally, back in the old days, it used to be done with paper. Now it's just done on the computer really quickly. So this is what happens after a share split. So 800 went to 800,000. But what's critical here is that if you take the number of shares times the share price, that equals the market value. And so a lot of times you'll see people talk about, well, you know, Apple hit $200 a share, $300 a share. I don't really care. Tell me how much the entire company is worth. The per share value fluctuates on a daily basis. That doesn't really matter to investors. They care about the, the total value. Um, and then so let's look at the profit that was made here. So Alice and Bob didn't go into this in order to just make money off their 50,000 kroner. 
But their initial investment, they each now own about 6% of the business. And I mean, that's, that's rough, but they brought in a lot of money in order to grow their business. So they own 6% of the business. Each of them now have 12 and a half million kroner of value. It's pretty good. They had 250 times their money. The seed investor is probably very happy also because they got 25 times their money. And that's not even crazy. I have investments where I've gotten 20 times, 25 times my money. It's very good. Um, I haven't gotten the cash out yet, so that's, that's another story. And then you have the Series A investor who came in later. A lot of the, the whole process, a lot of the company was, was already validated at, at that point, so there was a lot less risk. So they only got 6.2 times their money. Series B, much less risk also, got two and a half times their money. And then at the point of the IPO, the people putting in their money, they haven't made any profit, but um, it's, still, uh, it's still potential for them in the future. But the Series A and the Series B uh, investors here, the ones that got six and, and two and a half times their money, they're really not happy. Because most venture investors, they require a 10x return in order to make any investment a success. So, um, and one thing to think about is an investor who's doing a series, uh, I adjusted the numbers here. So, um, an investor that's doing a series A or a series B, they might invest one tenth of their fund. Of all the money they have, they might invest one tenth of it in every company. And so they want to get 10 times their money back in order to what they call return the fund. And if you can have one investment that returns the entire capital to, to your investors, everything else is just profit. And so they like that math. Um, venture capital investors live with just like back of the envelope calculations or whatever you can do on that uh, iPhone calculator. So that's very easy for them. OK. So let's talk about a little bit how investors look at startups. What do they think about when they're sitting on the other side of the table or listening to a presentation? Really what they're thinking is, if I can put one into this black box, can I get two out? Or really, 10. But if you can prove to the investor that, that your business is successful enough, or will be successful enough, that you can turn one into two, then uh, you'll get money from pretty much any investor. Now, unfortunately, most, pretty much all early stage companies, they're turning one into a half. They're losing money. So every kroner that they take in, they're going to return half of it back at best. But if you go to them and say, well, I can, I can return half now, but six months later, you're suddenly turning one into one, and then you finally turn one into two, that's what the investor's really looking for, somebody who's making progress and who can actually generate profit on an investment. So I always talk about making one into two. So, there are a lot of different things that are, that are going on within the, the head of an investor. The first is, is this a big problem? Is this person solving a problem that's, that's really worth solving? But do they have a solution that is a proper solution to the problem? So there are a lot of problems out there, and there are a lot of solutions, but um, there's a whole story about Starbucks. Starbucks doesn't solve the problem of thirst. Starbucks solves the problem that there aren't many places where you can go and sit with friends and have a pleasant conversation. That's their business. They are a place for you to sit down. They happen to sell coffee, and you can see it all over their investor material that where they talk about, uh, talk about that. They happen to sell coffee is how they put it. Um, but the problem that they're solving is not thirst. If they just went out there and talked about, well, we solved the problem of thirst, people wouldn't really be interested. So you want to show that there is what they call problem solution fit that the problem that's being solved is big, the solution actually solves it so much that people would want to uh, have that solution. And then there's another step, which is the product. And the way I like to think about it is if you have a disease, somewhere in the laboratory someone finds a chemical that will kill the virus, whatever. It's still not a product. There's a whole process, and sometimes it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to turn a chemical into a pill or an inhaler, or an injection, et cetera. So going from the solution to the product is actually really quite difficult. And most people, most entrepreneurs fail within this, within this process. Now, of course, if you can get to a point where you actually have a product, something that someone can buy, you have prices, you have a delivery mechanism, et cetera, then you need to understand the market. So you need problem solution fit, then you need solution product fit, and then you need product market. This is a lot. 
And then you have the product in the market. So, so it might be a really great product, and there might be a lot of people out there that want to buy this. But can you actually, the, can you actually have distribution channels that can get it out there? There are products that are sometimes just too big. Like you, you, if you had a product that was you know, the size of a car, you couldn't put it into Walmart. It's, the channel just can't fit that product. Um, so even if you have product market fit, you need to have channel product channel fit and then channel market fit. And then lastly, and again, this could be a whole series of lectures, you need to have product founder fit and then founder market fit. Because you can have all this, but if the investor thinks that you need to have a PhD in this or you need to have 10 years of more, more of work experience, if you're not the right person to build this business from an idea to, to a huge business, you're not going to get uh, funds from the investors. So there's different levels of readiness that you can have. This is from Steve Blank, who is kind of the godfather of Lean Startup. And the first level is just a, a first pass of the business model canvas. That should be your first kind of go-to document, something that, that you start off with. The next thing you should do is you should go out and you should figure out what, how big is the market size, how many competitors do you have, you know, what, is, what is the uh, competitive environment for your company. I've seen people that have built products, um, spent months or years on these products, but when they actually go to do the market size assessment, they figure out that even if they had every single customer in the world and no one ever left them, they still would not be profitable. So that's why that's the number two <laughs> thing that you do. Is this a big enough problem? Also, it, it's very important because most investors will assume that you operate in the first few years without any competition. So if you say, well, if you just run a lot of advertising and you have a very active sales force, you'll get customers. Now, if this is a hotly contested market and there are lots of people going after those customers, then you have to start doing the math of how many customers are going to call or how many competitors are going to call. It, it gets very messy. You have to assume that you're going to operate without competition for a couple years because the market is just so big. You need to show that you have problem solution validation in order to get to the third level. And this is just go out, talk to customers, make sure they understand the problem the way that you uh, understand the problem, and that you understand that this is a solution that's so good that they will drop what they're doing right now, and they will use your solution. Create a prototype, something that, for them to test, very low fidelity MVP. Does everyone know what an MVP is? OK. Yeah, OK, good. Um, you need to validate product market fit. So go out there, understand, is this something that people will actually pay for within the market? So the right side of the canvas is, uh, so that's customer segments and value proposition and channels and a missing one. But the sixth level of readiness, which my thermometer right there is at the sixth level of readiness, is validating the right side of the canvas. You don't have to validate the left side, which is key partners, key resources, key activities, but the, the right side in terms of understanding the customers, understanding the channels of how you get there, understanding the relationships that you have with the customers, that's incredibly valuable and you know, necessary at, at this stage. You want to have a high fidelity. You know, after you've identified how you're going to deal with the customers, create a much more uh, validated um, MVP. And then you want to validate the left side. The left side is more of the, of the market, whereas the right side is more of the customers. And then in every business, there are metrics, metrics that matter and metrics that don't matter. Um, you know, I, I talked to a business in Sweden that had six or 700,000 people that had downloaded their app, but they are pretty much bankrupt. And so they, they can show a really nice chart of how many people have downloaded their app. But if you ask them, well, can you show me a revenue chart that looks like that? No, of course not. So um, validate the metrics that really matter. and. Um, so this is literally from, from one to nine. Uh, be very honest with yourself. You know, figure out where you are within this readiness level. And then you kind of work on this roadmap. Because when you talk to an investor, they, they think about one thing, risk. The second thing they think about is return, which is over here. But, so the expected return, with more risk, I should get more return. If I'm lending money to the government uh, as a bond, or if I'm putting money in the bank, I would expect very little return. But if I'm giving you, um, you know, money for your asteroid mining business, I would expect a lot of money back. 
Same thing with investment size. If it's a very low risk investment, I'll put a lot of money in there. Um, but if it's very high risk, most investors will put very little money in the extremely high risk stuff. Most people that I talk to uh, uh, on their first pass, they're sitting right here, meaning that the investment size that they're asking is far greater than most investors would give for that level of risk. And the expected return that they're, they're guaranteeing or they're promising is much lower than the investors would want. And so the first thing you could do is you could take your investment size and just ask for less money. Don't ask for 10 million, ask for 1 million. It's potential. And then, therefore, you could also ask for a much higher return. Well, we're taking in less money, and then we'll be much more efficient with that money, and so we can give you a much greater return. But in reality, what you should do is you should just reduce the risk. You can ask for the same amount of money with the same return, but if you can reduce the risk that the investor sees within your investment, uh, you're much more likely to get uh, money. So there are 11 risks. I love lists. I have lots and lots of lists up here. My wife hates it. Um, so you have market timing risk. Uh, it might be a really, really good idea, but now is just not the time for it, whether you're too early or too late. Market adoption risk. The market is huge, but there are a lot of players in the market already. And you know what? There's just not room for another person in this market. Then there's market size risk. Some markets are just too small. Even if you have 100%, it's just not worth it. You have technology risk. Uh, most startups that are very successful are not taking on this technology risk. You know, how hard was it really to build Facebook? Not very hard. So it, it's not much of a technology risk. Now to scale it to a billion people, that's really hard. You know. Uh, but to make the first version was not very hard. Um, biotech and lots of other fields have very high technology risk. Business model risk. Can you actually make money off the idea? Believe it or not, this is a, this is a big deal. Um, how they're going to make money off Snapchat, I don't know. But the business is worth you know, double digit billions of dollars. Um, but you know, there, there are very significant risks there. This is the big one. This is pretty much in, in every assessment of a, of a company, which is execution risk, uh, which is I might believe in the product, I might believe in the story, the market, everything is great, but is the person that is pitching the idea going to be able to do it? Um, that's usually the cause of a lot of failure. Capitalization structure risk. If there's a lot of investors already there, is there room for another investor? Some investors say, I need to have... 40% of the business. And you might look at the cap table and just say, there's just not room. Platform risk. Maybe you're building your technology on top of somebody else's platform, like Facebook, et cetera. Um, and they could change that at any minute and put you out of business. Venture management risk. This is kind of an arrogant venture capital uh, idea. But essentially, it means if I give this person feedback, are they going to listen to my advice? Uh, venture capitalists have to be very comfortable not having control over a company. But if they're dealing with an extremely arrogant person that's never going to listen to their feedback, even if it's the best idea in the world, they'll probably turn the investment down because they don't want to have to deal with the person. Uh, and then there's financial risk, which is more you know, borrowing money from the bank and, and dealing with um, the, the, you know, the, the financial markets. And then lastly, there's legal risk. Okay. So we're going to play a little game. You be the venture capitalist. OK. Um, so Alice and Bob want to open up a coffee shop in downtown Oslo. Alice has worked in marketing. Bob is a computer programmer. What's going down from the top? What's, what are some risks? I'll start this one off. Uh, the first is market adoption risk. Why would anyone open up yet another coffee shop in downtown Oslo? Market size risk, eh, it's a big enough market. Norwegians love their coffee. Technology risk, there's not much there. Business model risk, people know how to run uh, coffee shops, even if, you're not, if you, even if you don't have experience there. But you know what? There's still execution risk. Maybe Bob and Alice just can't get out of bed before 9 o'clock, and, and they're going to screw the whole thing up. So that's always there. But cap structure risk, uh, platform, you know, there's very little there. OK, so let's go on to the next one. Alice and Bob want to build a shopping center near the University of Oslo. And they both together own a construction company. 
and we're going to assume that they know what they're doing. Market timing risk, it's always time for shopping centers. Market adoption risk, though, there's a lot of shopping around here. Maybe that's going to be a risk. Um, for about two years of my life, I was, I was uh, doing some real estate investing, and we would literally just create maps of every store within a, within a region to try to figure out, is there room for yet another uh, shopping center? So that's always there. And market size risk, technology risk, business model risk, we, you know, we pretty much know how to, how to build and run a shopping center. The one that, that stands out here is financial risk because you have to borrow a lot of money from the bank. And if you don't pay the money back to the bank, the bank takes the company. So there's financial risk. And then, of course, there's execution risk. That's always there. OK. So Alice and Bob want to create an app that allows people to share music for free, just like Napster. Now, Alice knows marketing, and Bob knows computer programming. What's the number one thing that you think is a risk as an investor? Legal risk, yes. Um, OK, so obviously we know that's illegal, right? Maybe not you know, for everybody. But um, what's another thing that really stands out? Well, no, financial, because they're not going to really go to banks. But if they're going to give it away for free, how are they going to make money? Business model risk. And then, because I had to find one, one chance for it, venture management risk. And I put this in here because odds are, if you're hearing the pitch from Alice and Bob, they've talked to a lot of other investors, and most people have probably told them it's a horrible idea. And if they haven't changed their mind yet, then um, they're not taking feedback. OK. So Alice and Bob want to create a cure for the common cold, and they both have a PhD in biochemistry. They want to create it, and they want lots of money in order to set up a lab so that they can work on it. You can just call it out. Hey, we don't have technology, a, risk. technology risk. Yes, yeah, we don't have a lot of time. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat here. Legal risk, because they're probably going to patent it. And then there's lots of legal issues in terms of enforcing patents all over the world. And there will be a lot of people that say, well, this is a, a right for humanity. So we're going to make the pill and not pay you any um, anything. OK, Alice and Bob want to create an app that lets visitors to Oslo share pictures on Facebook. Alice is a student, and Bob programs computers, as always. OK, timing risk, eh, adoption risk, eh, market size risk. This is a tiny, tiny market, but yet I still see these every year. My apologies if you've pitched this to me. Um, technology risk, that's not a very hard thing to do. But business model risk, how are you going to make money off of it? Yeah, we can have advertisers here. No, you're not going to make money off that. Um, execution risk should be pretty much everywhere. And then I put in platform risk, because a lot of businesses have been essentially put out of business when Google or Facebook or MySpace or whatever change. And so every couple years, you'll hear about an algorithm change, or Facebook does this, or Google does that. There are literally companies that have to fire people based upon the platform risk that they took. So Alice and Bob want to create the next generation of robot butler. They've already sold 85% of their company to investors. Oof. And Alice is a robotics engineer, and Bob is a butler, so they know what to do. <laughs> That's my favorite joke. Um, OK. So is the world ready for robot butlers? Market timing risk is a, is a big deal here. OK. And then we have technology risk, because I really don't think they can do it. Um, and then I, I put this in here. I have seen companies that have sold 80 or more percent of their business to investors before they even launch a product. Because they keep going back, and they run out of money, and they run out of money, and the investors just say, I, I want more of the business. Um, and I think that has always gone bad for the entrepreneurs. So here, capitalization structure is a really big deal, because I would not go in as the, as the next investor here. So um, I think we're, we're a little late on time. I'm not going to go through all the factors that you would negotiate with a, with a venture capitalist, but you can look these up. Uh, but things such as valuation, how much is my company worth? How much leverage do you have as a shareholder? Who controls the board? Liquidation preference, essentially, when I sell my company, do you get any money first, or do we split it evenly to begin with? Um, as we bring on new investors, do you get diluted down? 
That's what they call when, you, when your share gets smaller and smaller. Sometimes investors will come in and say, I own 10%, no matter how many new investors you bring in. Um, they'll set a, a stock option pool for later employees. When you create a company, there's something called vesting. Sometimes an investor will say that, yeah, I know you think you own 50% of the company now, but if you leave tomorrow, I want all of those shares. So sometimes they'll sign you into a contract that says that you will get the right to own your shares over the course of, say, four years. And so this is very important for, for founders because oftentimes people will leave. And so you need to have something in writing saying that you'll give the shares back if you leave as a, as a founder. But then, of course, there's protection for founders. Minimum investment. Um, if you need 10 million kroner, you're not going to settle for seven. If you really need that much, the investment will only happen if you reach a certain level. And then pay to play provision, which essentially means if you need more money in the future, can you force the investor to put more money in? These are all the different things. And, and again, this is an entire semester of courses um, that uh, you will negotiate with an investor uh, on, a, on a term sheet. And I forgot to mention, the term sheet is the, the document that you negotiate between you and the, the investor. It's the, the uh, kind of a letter of intent between the two. And so I'm going to show very quickly uh, an actual negotiation between uh, investors. Why is this company valued at a million dollars? Because that's basically what you're telling me it's worth when you ask me for $150,000 to 15%. Sure. Post so money. We started in August 2008. We sold about 30,000 bars to date, just 20,000 this year. We're on track to hit 44,000 bars by the end of the year. We've doubled our sales in just in the last six months. We've grown 50% per year. So you grossed how much last year? So last, well, it was only a partial year. We August 2008, so we only grossed 12,000. So this year we're about $50,000 to date. He knows it's his numbers. In business, mm -hmm. but the value that you're telling your business is worth is insane. You've got 50,000 in sales, so I believe the machines work and you sent some bars and got it. That's all you have. You don't have a million dollar business, and yet you want me to give you my money as if you did. I understand your perspective. I've actually worked in VC. My goal you is say you worked in venture capital, then you know my job is to squeeze your head like a teenage pimple right now. <laughs> and I absolutely understand that. I understand, and you also understand that on the other side of the table, that you're buying into not only the business, but you're buying into me. So let me ask you a question. You're a VC guy. You're a smart guy. What's more important, the idea or execution? I, I believe it's execution. I do too. So how do you go in a year and a half with an interesting idea to a million dollars? Do you think it's worth that today? I, I believe it's worth it today. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't really believe it's worth a million dollars today. You can't. You're too smart a guy. If you sat around in your kitchen or wherever, came up with an idea, and a year and a half later, you want to say it's worth a million dollars. I, I genuinely believe it. I mean, I eat the energy bar for breakfast this morning. It's something that once it enters your lifestyle... How much of your own money have you put into this business? I put $50,000 of my own money, and I haven't taken a salary out of this company in a year and a half. Cry me a river. I believe in it so strong. That's what I'm willing to commit to. You've got to do that. You're a startup guy. Everybody knows you've got to work I, like I, that. Absolutely. But I'm selling you my passion. I'm selling you both the horse and the jockey. Okay, let's say you're wonderful and did a great presentation. You have $50,000 in sales. If I said your company was worth 10 times that, it would still only be worth half a million dollars. And you want not 10% more than that. You want 100% more than that. Mm -hmm. Are you being a savage, greedy pig or not? This guy's my hero. <laughs> I'm doing what's in the best interest of the company and the idea. Well, maybe not, because... Yeah, you may lose the day. Oof. I mean, there is a saying in business that the first person to say the number loses, and you really did put up a very high number. If a greater equity was out there, would that still interest you or, or period? You're I'm offering more equity? Well, I, that's certainly a possibility. Why don't you put out a number? Put out a number, yeah. No, I, I can't negotiate with myself. You pull the lever. I'm giving you the power. <laughs> The valuation is still crazy, as he said. I would have to have 75%. Is that an offer? Ooh. Oh, my God, this guy's great. I love this. <laughs> you should forget this business. Come work for me. For 75% of the business, I'll give you 150000 I, I mean, I, I'm open to hearing what the different options are out there. What are you going to do? So I'll start with Damon Offer. At 75%, you have to understand from my perspective, too, that it would completely demotivate me as an entrepreneur and would also limit me in terms of growing in the future. Capitalization so 75% is way too much. 
and I have one last counter proposal. Okay? It's a do or die. Okay? I got it. Um, I want to license Element Bars. I'll put up the $150,000, and you'll receive 4% of sales forever, and I want to own 35% of the company. Okay? Does he take it? Is that a deal that you can do? It sounds nitpicky, but you got to get to my negotiating range. <laughs> my negotiating range is 25%. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, I have That's to be on the one way. <laughs> Jonathan, all right, I'll tell you what. I'm a fair guy. I will, I'll split the 35 and the 25 and 30, but that's it. <laughs> all right, 30%. We have a deal. Okay. All right. All right. That's pretty much a day at the office for me. I want to get that music to play in the background just to mess with people. Um, that's, that's my contact info. If you want to reach me, I'll also stick around for a little bit afterwards. Sorry I, I ran a bit long, but um, as you can see, I mean, that's, that's a very complex negotiation. Uh, that's a very condensed and televised uh, you know, television uh, reality show version, but that's not you know, unheard of. So, all right, and that's from Shark Tank. If you don't uh, watch that weekly, you should. Okay, great.